Test for sound, we're up. Okay, today is our last topic. We're gonna to talk about biotechnology, which is kind of a fun one because now we're gonna discuss kind of the cutting edge, what, what, what are biologists and geneticists, what are they working on today in terms of like some of the cool tech that's involved? And like maybe you guys have heard of some of this stuff before. We're gonna eventually talk like cloning and uh, genetically modified organisms and, and those sorts of things. Uh, I recently was watching with my wife, um, we just downloaded on iTunes, uh, Jurassic World. Anybody watch like the Jurassic Park movie franchise at all, right? Where they're like trying to genetically engineer the, what do they call it? The Indomosaurus or something like that. They had a new name for like their, if you, if you watch the movie, you know what I'm talking about, right? Where they're like trying to like use genes of old dinosaur, okay, no, scientists aren't actually doing that. But like that's the concept, right? Of like using genes and figuring out how can you fit something new together. That's our concept today. So the first definition I need you guys to know is biotechnology. And really, the definition of biotechnology kind of is what you'd think it would be, right? Any sort of technology that we're going to use to try to manipulate and work with genetics and genes and biology, right? Does that make sense? So I've got a whole bunch of slides here that basically kind of talk through some, some interesting things that are happening. For example, here is an example that maybe you might not think it's necessarily technology so much, but it fits underneath the heading. It's called artificial selection. And farmers or anyone who's really been breeding animals, they've been doing this for years and years and years, well before we were talking about like anything that involved like cool technology. I have a picture on there I wanna talk about first. It has the pictures of all of the triple crown championship champions for horses. I don't know if you guys know a whole lot about horse racing, but let me just give you a bit of a, a rundown. The, the, uh, the Triple Crown, as a horse, basically there are three races every year that are like the big races. And I forget what they are. One's the Kentucky Derby, one is the Belmont, and I forget the third. And if a horse happens to win all three of the big races, they win what's called the Triple Crown. That's really hard to do. Like, you can count on there. It's only happened, what, 12 times in history? Well, here's what ends up happening. If a horse wins the Triple Crown, it must mean that they were a really good racehorse, right? Like, to be able to pull off a feat like that, they are very good. They must be strong, athletic, maybe like, they must be pretty smart, they must be able to have endurance. They have good genetics, that horse. Well, you know, other people who want to race racehorses would love to have that racehorse's kids. Does that make sense? Right? Because the offspring of a champion like that is likely to also be very strong and a very good racehorse, right? I mean, think about it. If you want to own a racehorse, do you want a crappy racehorse or a good racehorse? Yeah, and so if you're trying to like go buy a brand new racehorse that's just about to be born, are you gonna buy one where the parents, like the mom and dad horses, were like weak and feeble? Or do you want the, the racehorses who are like strong? Right, yeah. Uh, even sports nowadays, um, a lot of um, um, sports teams are actually starting to, to draft when they get a chance to like choose their new players. They draft um, players whose parents played in the uh, played the sport as well. So for anybody who's like a big baseball fan, the uh, Toronto Blue Jays, their big prospect right now is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And uh, his dad was Vladimir Guerrero Sr. Great baseball player, right? Like Hall of Famer, best hitter, one of the best hitters of all time, right? And it would appear that genetically, that baseball playing ability seems to have been passed down to his kid. Does that make sense? Anyways, back to artificial selection. You guys can read the slide here. Basically, the idea behind artificial selection is that you want to take the best and you want to like use them to breed your next generation. The idea here is that like the less desirable traits get weeded out because you're only using the strong, the best of the best, right? Um, my brother-in-law, he, he has a, like a small acreage where they do just a little bit of cattle farming, right? But really the same, the same principle applies there, right? You want to have a strong bull that you are breeding your, your calves with, right? You don't want to use something that's like a bull that like is prone to disease. Does that make sense? So in a way, biotechnology has allowed scientists to try to be able to try to create like the perfect offspring, right? We don't really do this with humans so much, because that's maybe not ethical, but we definitely do it with plants and animals. Does that concept make sense, the idea of selecting and breeding individuals that have the desirable traits? So, so that's one example. 
Here's another one, plant cloning. Now, we talked about sexual and asexual reproduction before. The idea about how you either have something grow because two gamete cells come together, or maybe it's actually going, undergoing mitosis instead and it's just growing that way, right? Well, what you could do is if you find a plant that is a strong plant, like it seems to be really uh, vibrant and desirable traits, what you might do is you might slice off just a little section of that plant, right? And you're gonna use it to grow an identical plant. Now, with something like strawberries, you could actually just plant that strawberry and it would grow entirely. But maybe if that's not gonna work, maybe if you do need to have sexual reproduction, maybe you can then re remove cells from the plant and, and fertilize them in a Petri dish. And so that's called plant cloning. And really, scientists right now are actually, I've even got a slide on this at the end of the notes, but scientists are kind of working on, well, what about other types of cloning, like sheep cloning and human cloning? Can we, can we take cells out of one species and kind of put them somewhere else if those cells have desirable traits that are they're, they're gonna be strong and effective? This plant right here is not gonna die the first time that frost hits it. So that's plant cloning. Uh, here's a two examples, there's actually two on this slide. And I'm actually gonna start with where it says at the very, very bottom in italics, italics. These are actually processes that people who maybe have problems getting pregnant might utilize. Um, I know some people who, you know, they're about my age and they, they wanna start a family. And sometimes it just, it doesn't work. Even though you're attempting to try to have kids, sometimes, you know, something's wrong or something's not working perfectly. And so the word we use for that is infertility. You guys ever heard that word before, to infertility? And maybe you'll like see this in pop culture medium. Um, I don't know if any of you guys watch Friends now that it's on Netflix, but like um, Phoebe on Friends, she would have gone through what was called in vitro fertilization when she had her triplets. If you ever watch that show? All right, so here's anyways, here's the two different types of ways that we can try to have what's called artificial reproduction, okay? Neither of these involve like having sex, okay? Both of these are artificial. Okay. So the first one, artificial insemination. What you basically do is you take sperm from one source and you basically, you okay, so there's no actual sexual intercourse required here. I mean, the best example is in livestock. You guys can read that there, right? You take sperm from a bull and you just specifically put it into the cow, right? And that's artificial insemination. Whereas in vitro fertilization, rather than taking the sperm and giving it to the egg right at the source, you actually take the sperm out, you take the egg out, and you combine them in a Petri dish, which is just like a little dish like that, right? And then it gets implanted into something called a surrogate. I'm gonna highlight this word. You guys know what a surrogate means? Yeah, that'll work. What was that? <laughs> um, yeah, you're right, yeah, somebody else carries your baby, right? So it'd be as though there's Okay, stay with me, okay? It would be as though there's you know, sperm and egg, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the sperm, remove the egg, combine them together somewhere else, and then in a different female, so not this man and not this female, we're gonna remove their sperm and remove their egg, and then once they're combined in a Petri dish, then it's gonna get inserted into a, a different woman's uterus for it to grow. It's called a surrogate. Does the mom who gives birth, does it share any genetic relationship with the baby? No, no they don't. Right. And so that's how a couple who's trying to have a kid that is their own kid, genetically it is their child, they're able to do that. And I mean other options by the way are things like adoption or foster homes for those who are infertile, but those are the two main, the two main ways that we can uh, cause reproduction, but it does, it does not involve actually having sex. Uh, next one here is something called genetic engineering. And um, I put in italis, italics here, the science behind some of this technology is advancing rapidly and maybe too rapidly. Okay. I said sometimes too quickly for the ethical implications to keep pace. Okay, so sometimes we can do things and we gotta think about well, should we do it? Because maybe it's actually not a good thing to do. I got an, an interesting example. It is actually now possible to have three parents for one kid. Yeah, let me explain how this works. So in your DNA, you guys hopefully kind of, you guys learned about cells last year a little bit, right? Okay, so inside your cell, you have a nucleus. 
And that's what we've been talking about mostly, is that inside your nucleus there's DNA, and that DNA has genes and chromosomes and, and alleles inside of it, right? And that's inside the nucleus. And that is actually the main focal point of your DNA. However, there's actually a small amount of DNA found in a different part of your cell, the mitochondria. Does anybody know what a mitochondria does? Yeah, it powers your, it powers your cell. Okay? So there's actually two different sources of DNA inside your cell. Now, the DNA that actually causes your genes to replicate is all in the nucleus. But there's DNA in the mitochondria as well. Interesting. So here's what they can do. They take sperm from a dad, and they take, say, an egg, and the DNA and the nucleus from a mom. But let's say it's getting implanted into a surrogate or through like some sort of artificial insemination. It's actually possible to take a third person, a female's DNA, and change out the mitochondrial DNA. And so rather than having the, the mom having like the DNA that's in the nucleus and the mitochondria be the same, they can actually swap it out. And so it's actually possible to have DNA from three parents. Now, the, the, the DNA that's in the mitochondria doesn't really impact it that much, but in a way you can kind of say that like you can have three parents, right? Um, it's actually being used in some cases for, um, um, a, say, who want to have a child. And um, they have to find a sperm donor because obviously two women can't have a child by themselves, right? And they would both like to be genetically um, a parent. And so the sperm donor is like, you know, a dad, although it's not, you know what I'm saying? The, the dad's not really part of that relationship. And the two same-sex couple women, they can now both be parents. Now, here's the question, though. Ethically, boy, that changes things, hey? Because, I mean, we, we have, you know, we have households that have two parents. And, and there's blended families that have one parent. But, like, now to have... A child that has three parents, how do you do custody if someone breaks up? Right? Like that's, it's interesting, right? It's ch challenging questions. Right. Cloning would be another one when we get to that, right? Like, should we use cloning? For example, if we could clone you so that you could grow yourself a new heart. Your heart is dying. You need a new heart. And so we clone you. We regrow a new you in a test tube somewhere. For the sole purpose of growing a new you so that we can take the heart out of your clone and put it in you so you can live. Is that okay? Because in theory, we'd be killing your clone by removing their heart. Right? I mean, to some people, maybe they're like, yeah, yeah, we should do that because it saves me. But others might be like, well, hang on a sec here. We just made a new person and we killed them just to use their body parts. Right? And so if that becomes feasible one day to do, is that ethical? Challenging, isn't it? So, anyways, here's another interesting example of genetic engineering. This is one I'd love, love for you guys to know. It's called golden rice. Okay. Again, this is kind of story time with Chris here again. Um, golden rice. Anybody ever heard of golden rice, by the way? Oh, cool. Some of you have some knowledge of it. Okay. So here's the basics. People who live in third world countries, um, like you know, we're probably talking tropical nations where they don't necessarily have as as vibrant of a food supply as we do. They often suffer from vitamin A deficiency. They just they lack vitamin A in their in their systems. In, in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, like we have access to pretty much any food we want, right? Like our niche is very broad. We can eat almost anything, right? But if you're if you're in a, in, a, in an area where food supply is limited, you might not be getting enough vitamin A in your diet, and that causes some problems. Right? And it's it's very expensive sometimes to eat the fruits and vegetables that you need to get vitamin A. And and poor countries they don't have the money to get that. Does that make sense? And so what scientists have been working on is trying to find a way to put vitamin A into rice. Because rice is like one of the cheapest and easiest forms of food for some people in third world countries to be able to eat, right? It's, it's plentiful, it's cheap, it's easy to grow, it doesn't take a lot of space. Unlike, say, like fruit trees, like getting like oranges, maybe they can't grow oranges. Maybe they can't grow strawberries, you get what I'm saying there? But they can, they can eat rice, right? So what they've done is they've tried to add beta carotene genes from a different species into rice. And they've genetically made a new strain of rice called golden rice. Golden rice didn't used to exist, but they've like they've made it, they've created it by basically taking this gene of beta carotene and adding it to rice with the idea of helping to combat vitamin A deficiency. Really clever idea, actually. Right. Now, sometimes you hear um, these terms, though. This would be considered, golden rice, a GMO. Have you ever heard of a GMO? 
It's called a genetically modified organism. And one of the challenges to GMOs is that they're new, they're brand new. It's like, it's like we're making a brand new food monster in a way. You know, where it's kind of like, you guys know like the story of like Frankenstein, how they like pieced him together with old dead body parts and tried to like make him come alive. Okay, maybe it's not quite that gruesome, but in the same kind of concept here, it's like we're making a brand new species. Like when I was talking about Jurassic World, right? We're making a brand new species of food that never existed before. And those ethical implications are challenging because we don't know how, how it's going to react. What if this new food is, is, is cancer constant? cancer causing, right? We have no evidence to, to know that in advance because it's, it's brand new. You get what I'm saying? Or what happens if this brand new strain of rice, if all of a sudden, if some birds ate it, they all died because it's just, it's toxic to birds. But then if those birds die, that has a huge effect on the ecosystem because now if the birds die, the spider population takes off. And if the spider population takes off, then the snakes can't survive or something, right? Like, I don't know, maybe you don't actually care about spiders or snakes. But do you get what I'm going here? So I've got a couple of slides here that now talk about some of the, the challenges behind GMO stuff. Here's actually a slide that kind of presents some of the positives to it. This is a genetically modified tomato. There's actually two, actually. In this section right here, these are just old, ordinary tomatoes, nothing special about them. And these are GMO tomatoes, genetically modified ones, where what they've done is they've gene silenced one of the genes that causes tomatoes to like soften and shrivel up. Like you guys can see how they're kind of getting kind of gross here after 20 and 45 days, right? Well, in these GMO tomatoes, it's a month and a half later and they still look brand new. Like I would buy this off the shelf at the store, this tomato. You get what I'm saying there? So I mean, some people look at that and they go, hey, I'll take that, right? But other people, they want to question back on the other side and say, yeah, but what's it gonna do to you? Could that give you cancer? Could that make you become sick? Like it's not natural. Does that make sense? Like it's not naturally found, right? And that's where sometimes we talk about things that are organically grown versus not. Now, there's a difference actually. Organic means that it was grown without pesticides. Okay? Whereas a GMO means that in a lab somewhere, someone was actually working on like designing this. A really interesting one in the news recently was A&W. They made a burger, uh, yeah, out of just plants. And it wasn't actually meat anymore. It was like, it's supposed to be a burger. It's supposed to be like meat, but it's like out of plants. They like made it in a lab somewhere. Well, and I heard recently there was some controversy. I need to read into it where they were actually pulling it. I don't know whether it's because it caused bad health effects. I'm not actually sure. But yeah, it was a, they were, they were advertised it really hardcore. Anybody heard of that one before? The whole A&W advertising the, the, the plant burgers? Yeah. yeah. Interesting, eh? Yeah. Uh, here is a slide kind of presenting the other side where there are some people who think that the increase of using GMOs has caused more food allergies. Uh, evidence would suggest that there are a lot more food allergies today than there used to be. Um, for example, let me give you some common food allergies. Uh, allergies to gluten, allergies to milk and dairy, lactose uh, allergies, even things like allergies to peanuts and strawberries, right? I mean, please don't put up your hand because I, I don't need to know this, right? But just think to yourself, right? Like, do you know anybody who has a peanut allergy? Or do you know anybody who is lactose intolerant or has a gluten intolerance? I mean, I know someone for all three of those categories right off the bat, right? And it would seem that there seems to be an increase in that. Now, there is no necessarily evidence directly connecting the two, but here's two graphs that I found where uh, one of them, I believe, is how many allergies there are, and clearly allergies are increasing. And during that same time frame, the amount of GMOs is also increasing. So perhaps, because we're eating this genetically modified food, it's causing us to be more sensitive to, our, to the food we would otherwise eat. And now we have more peanut and dairy and gluten allergies. Maybe, right? There's, we're still working on the connection, right? That's why there's a question mark here. Uh, here's a slide I found that kind of talks about some pros and cons, right? GMOs might be more nutritious. Be tastier. No. Anyone ever had a grapple before? You know what a grapple is? It's like a, an apple that's supposed to like taste kind of like a grape. Maybe it's tasty, right? Uh, maybe it doesn't uh, catch as many diseases or drought, especially like we don't think of drought maybe as much in Canada. But if you were living somewhere in like a, like a more um, a warmer climate, more uh, tropical climate, the running out of water could be a huge issue. Right? California has some issues right now with running out of water in the summertime. It, it's going through so, such heat waves. 
that they can't find enough water to keep their strawberries and their cauliflower going. But if you have drought resistant cauliflower and it doesn't get quite as much water as you need, then maybe maybe it'll survive. Right? Uh, you guys can read these ones, right? So those are some pros, but here's some cons. There could be unexpected or harmful genetic changes that we don't know about. The unexpected is the key word because since this is brand new, right? Like we are literally making brand new species. Can I say that again? We are making brand new species here. We don't exactly know how it's gonna play out. In Jurassic World, it didn't end all that well. You get what I'm saying there, right? Now I'm not saying that's happening with genetically modified strawberries or golden rice, but it's a possibility. Um, here's an interesting one. What happens when our modified organisms, I'm going to change the color, you can't even see this. Let's go yellow. What happens when your modified organisms, what happens when they breed? Then what happens? Okay. So what happens if we genetically modify a pig, and then we genetically modify another type of pig, and they breed? Then what happens? Are we going to get like mutants, like in X-Men movies? Probably not, but does that make sense what I'm saying though, right? Like, again, we don't really know. Uh, here's another interesting one. This, there seems to be evidence of this, actually. Pesticide resistance and susceptibility in plants takes off. I want to give an example of, um, of something that we need to be careful of as, I don't know, humans in general. It's, uh, it's known as, um, uh, what's it called again? It's bacterial resistant uh, viruses. You guys ever heard of this before? Where if we take, if we give drugs too much to people, right, like whatever antibiotics we give, that's what it is. It's, it's um, antibiotic resistant viruses. Okay? And it's where like there's a virus, some sort of disease or something like that, right? And we have a way of curing it. We have biotics, we have medicine that can help cure it. Right? But if we prescribe it too much, the, the viruses, it learns how to beat the drugs. And so then we need stronger drugs. But then the viruses become stronger than those drugs. And so we need stronger drugs again. You guys ever heard of this before? I, I, I'm trying to remember the exact phrasing. It's like it's vi it's 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 antibiotic resistant um, bacteria or, or viruses, right? Have you got, have you guys heard of this before? Right. It's actually one of the reasons why um, when you get med medication, like let's say that your doctor gives you medication for ten days, and he says take one of these every day for ten days, and you feel better after five days, you're, you're supposed to take it for all ten days because we want to kill off that virus or that bacteria entirely. We want it entirely dead. Because if you only kill it a little ways and weaken it, it could come back stronger than before. And the virus or the bacteria might now be able to beat the medication. Because just like you know how we preach growth mindset and you guys, well, viruses and bacteria, they learn too. You know what I'm saying there? And so if the virus or bacteria, if it learns how to beat the medication, well, now you need stronger medication. And it's this vicious cycle where you always have to kind of make stronger and stronger and stronger meds. Right? Like penicillin needs to be like upgraded to, to fight new bacteria. Anyways, that's kind of what this last one here is about. It's about resistance and susceptibility. Is that sometimes if we, if we make stronger plants, well, maybe the disease comes back even stronger. So sometimes maybe it's better not to do that. Okay, I have one last slide and I think we're done here. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the ethical implications of something like, say, cloning. Uh, if you haven't maybe heard this before, uh, cloning's been around for a while. 1996, you guys weren't even born yet, were you? <laughs> so we're talking like, what, 22 years now, is the first time that uh, an animal species was actually cloned. And this one's really famous. Her name was Dolly the Sheep. Anybody ever heard this before? Dolly the Sheep, yeah. And so Dolly the Sheep was grown through, I believe, in vitro fertilization. I don't need you guys to memorize this picture. I just put it on here as a launching point. They had a, 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 um, um, a ewe, and they also had an egg donor. And basically, they separated the egg and the sperm. Uh, no, how do they do this again? Anyways, that's not really relevant. But they ended up through some sort of in vitro process, combined them together, and implanted a new genetic material into a surrogate mother. And, and basically, what ended up happening was they created this sheep named Dolly, who was actually a clone, I imagine, of this one right here. There was actually a, an exact clone of uh, who they started with. Now, I don't even know how this stuff works. Because like we're talking like past university level stuff. I just need you guys to know the basics, but we've actually been able to clone animals. But that's not the point. That's not what I want to talk about. I don't need you guys to know how to clone something. I just need you guys to consider, should we clone something? Is that a good idea or not? Now, there, I don't, I'm not saying there's a right answer here, but boy, it's, it's an intri intriguing idea, isn't it? Right? 
let me, let me give this one more like thought experiment again. If you could clone yourself to have an exact copy of you, purely so that you had extra parts for your body, so that if you all of a sudden had to lose a kidney, you could take your clone's kidney, should we or not? Is that ethical for you to like make another you just to kill them for their parts? I don't know. Interesting, isn't it? Challenging, eh? I don't know. That's really like the, that's the ethical question, right? It is. Unless, but maybe you don't consider it to be another human being, right? Like what if they're not, are they really alive maybe? That's a good point, right? Yeah. Challenging questions though, right? No. I mean, to some degree it's similar to say like, um, talks about abortion, right? Where when you have a baby inside a mother's womb, is it alive yet or not, right? Like how do we define that? It's challenging. Okay, um, you guys can kind of think about that one on your own, because again, there's no real right answer to that. But that kind of ends my, my topic. So give me, give me one more minute, guys. So biotechnology, we've talked about a whole bunch of new definitions here today. Let me re-go over them real quick. So artificial selection, where you basically, we're going to actually breed species, okay? They are actually going to, like, mate, okay? But we're going to very specifically pick the best and the brightest to go do that, okay? Cloning. We're going to literally find something that is very, very strong, a very good plant, and we are going to cut it, we are going to take the cells right out of it, and we are going to regrow those cells and clone them, right? Ethically, hmm, interesting. Artificial reproduction, often used in humans, actually, for infertility treatments. Two possibilities. You either artificially put sperm inside of the female's uterus to make an egg harvest, like to fertilize. So no actual sex happening here or in vitro fertilization, literally remove the egg, remove the sperm, put them together, have the zygotes combined, and then implant it in somebody else. Genetic engineering. Specifically, take some genes out of organism one and try to put them into organism two. Uh, the biology teacher at my old school always used to say that if he could do genetic engineering, he would try to take the photosynthesis genes out of plants and put them into humans. Because, think about how that would work. If we could take photosynthesis genes out of plants and put them into humans, we would be able to eat by just going outside in the sun. Because isn't that, isn't that how plants really grow, right? They just they grow from sunshine, right? I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but he always thought that would be interesting, right? If we could make humans that could photosynthesize just like trees do. Anyways. Uh, GMOs we talked about here. And... Uh, what was the last one? And then cloning, I guess, we've already discussed. So, yeah, those are some of the terms we need to know. Does anybody have any questions? Cool. Guys, we are one-fifth of the way down the year. We've done one out of five units, at least in terms of me talking at you, okay? So we've got some time left today. Like I always want to suggest, let's use it well, okay? So you've got a list of things to do over there on the side, minus the extinction project, and, and I guess the quizzes and tests. You should be able to work on anything, right? So I would suggest, let me give you some options here. One, keep working on that assignment. May as well just get it done now. Option two, our Cheerios activity. Work on that. Option three, and I really want to suggest that you guys need to do this, go over your old quiz. If we haven't talked about your mistakes and you don't know where you went wrong, we need to discuss that. Okay, I've already talked about facepalm versus whoosh mistakes. If it was all facepalm and you're like, oh, I knew that answer, of course, I know what a population is. Cool. But I'm fairly confident that at least everybody should ask me about a couple of questions. Because there's a few challenging ones on there that require a little bit of discussion as to what, why the answer is what it is, right? Make sure we talk. I challenge you guys, at some point today, ask me a question. Ask me two questions. That's why I have a job, guys. Okay? Those are some ideas on what to work on. If you guys would like to go somewhere else in the school, by all means, go ahead. The only thing I point out, though, is that I do want to encourage you guys to ask me questions. It is harder to do that when you're not nearby. Like, I will try to find when I'm in the same room as you. So, anyways, I will shut up now. You guys have about 40 minutes. Do what you need to do, guys.